Hello here, hello in the world, hello internet. I hope we are live now. And we come now to the closing session of Developer Week 2019. And we are very, very pleased to have him here as a speaker. He was a CTO at Mustang Software and at Starbase. He's one of the lesser Scots. You know, big Scott Guthrie and the two lesser Scots. In 2016, we had the first of the two lesser Scots here as keynoter, Scott Hanselman. And today, we have the other one. He is Director, Program Management of .NET. That means he is Mr. .NET. So, if you bully him, he will switch off .NET immediately. So, be very careful. And now, please give a warm welcome to Mr. .NET, Scott Hunter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. The, the best part was when you were reading my title, which is right on the screen behind you. Um, so I'm very happy to be here today in uh, uh, a developer week. Never been here before, uh, and super excited to talk about the future of .NET. As, as they said, um, I run the uh, program management team at Microsoft on .NET. I've been involved in .NET since 2007 at Microsoft. Um, and today, let's talk about um, what's going to ship later this year, and then what's going to ship next year, um, and even beyond next year. So I'll try to go through some of this, this kind of fast, because I have a ton of demos, and I assume people would prefer to see demos than to see uh, a bunch of slides. So eh. Um, <clears throat> This is just a highlight of, of a couple of customers that, that uh, we showed at the Build Conference later, earlier this year. And each of them is kind of something like Setpoint. They're, they're, they're a team that actually moved a desktop application to .NET Core 3 uh, because it gave them access to Windows 10 APIs. Uh, UPS is, is an interesting one. They're a shipping company, obviously. And um, in their case, they use Xamarin, so the the, it's the same app on Android and iOS. Um, Siemens is interesting because they're building microservices on top of .NET Core uh, on Linux and running it inside of Azure at Microsoft. Um, and then finally, I've got one more. Uh, this is a, a cool company. Um, they have uh, hazelnut dryers, and they wrote some ML.NET code that can predict when the dryers will be done drying the hazelnuts, um, which actually fires up to a, to a phone app that they, that they wrote using Xamarin. Um, so these are just highlighting some of the, the different technologies that are coming in the 3.0 wave of .NET Core. Um, people always ask me, uh, you know, .NET is not as old as Java, but it's pretty old. Um, you know, is .NET doing well? Uh, we added a million new developers last year, which I think is pretty good. And then .NET Core, which has only been out for about two years now, um, just actually already has hit it 1.2 million developers in two years, uh, which I think is great, great numbers. Um, today, we have a ton of stuff to go through. We're going to talk about big data, um, machine learning, mobile development, Windows apps, C Sharp 8, web and microservices, and then we'll talk about what comes after .NET Core 3. Um, so to start off with, I don't want to spend too much time on this, because this, this affects, of any of the audiences I talk to, this technology uh, touches the least of them. Um, there's a uh, project out there called Apache Spark. And what it's used for is it's used for big data processing. If you um, have a lot of logs you want to go through. Uh, we use it at Microsoft as part of the, the, the Visual Studio team. We use it for telemetry in Visual Studio. If, if Visual Studio is crashing or sending tel telemetry to us about it's being slow or something like that, it all goes into a huge Apache Spark database. Um, and the challenge with this was is this technology was only available for Scala, Java, and some Python uh, for the most part, um, you know, until now. Uh, about a month ago, we announced um, .NET support for Apache Spark. Um, and so this brings all of those, those big data workloads to .NET. Um, and so I, kind of my job is to make sure that no matter what your workload is, you don't have to switch into some other language uh, to do it. Um, and so we've already had a, a, a couple of big customers. 
uh, that have switched over from using some Python to do this kind of work to .NET after we announced this. Um, this is just showing, you know, I can't just be, say, Apache Spark works on .NET without saying it works great on .NET. Um, and so this chart lowers better. Um, and you can see that Scala uh, is 375. We're 406. We're not even done optimizing. We're still in preview. And we're almost uh, as, as fast as native Scala Apache Spark. We're faster than Python. Um, and if you run a really compute intensive load, we'll actually run faster. So our perf is really good. So you're not going to lose anything by moving uh, to .NET on Apache Spark. And I'm not going to do a demo, but I'm going to show a couple of interesting things about Apache Spark. Um, as I was, we were playing with this, we asked ourselves, well, I asked my team, what data do we have in .NET that actually is big enough to, to actually play with Apache Spark? We looked at all the tweets that we had since the beginning of .NET. That wasn't big enough. Uh, but we found this cool project called GHTorrent. And what it does is they take all of GitHub and make it available as these, these huge downloads on a monthly basis. And so that's 102 um, megs there, uh, un, uh, uh, uncompressed. It's 350 gigabytes once you, un, once you uncompress it. Um, and what I did is I took that data set. It's not what I wanted to do. I took that data set, and I actually uploaded it into Azure. And so you can see I've got all the commits, all the projects. Uh, you can see 121 gigabytes, 106 gigabytes, lots of gigabytes of data. And then what Apache Spark lets me do is I can run crazy queries against that data. So let's jump over to source. And I'll quickly show a query. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, because really, to use this tech, you have to have a lot of data. You want to have terabytes of data uh, to really enjoy this. But what's cool about it is <clears throat> what you do is you just write queries. And so in this case, um, I make a connection to my Spark session. Um, you saw that in my data storage, I had a bunch of CSV files. And so I have to give those CSV files a schema. And so you can see I say uh, commits spark.read, I give it an int, a string, an author, um, and tell it to load each of those files. And once I do that, I can then start writing queries. Um, and so this is the first query that I wrote here, which is just go find all the C-sharp projects um, and rank them by stars. What are the most popular C-sharp projects that are out there in, uh, in, in uh, all of GitHub? Um, and then I just, this is, I'm not going to use this code, but I wanted to show as well, Apache Spark also supports SQL. So you can actually take huge amounts of data, um, put them into this thing, and write SQL queries against it, just like you would in a, in a relational database today if you don't know the Apache Spark, sy Apache Spark syntax. Um, and then I can do some, some uh, crazier things with that. I take those stars, and um, I have one more thing I want to show here because I did it right here. Um, this line here is actually super important. Um, that huge data set, notice that I put a filter here on C Sharp uh, before I actually, as I loaded the uh, CSV file. That means as part of the load, I got rid of everything that was not C Sharp, which meant this significantly sped up the query. When we first built this, the query took about three minutes to run. Adding that, that one exclusion, took that huge data set and knocked it down quite a bit, so it was just that data set. Um, and then you can see what I did here is after the stars, uh, the next thing we're going to do here is do a crazy query where I basically want to say, let's go figure out uh, the top projects, most starred projects in GitHub that are C Sharp based, and then let's go look at see when commits happen on a weekly basis. Um, now, what's cool about Apache Spark is, I go back to my, my browser. Hopefully, I'm not logged out over here. Um, let's see, it's connecting. Um, I can then take this, that, that query I wrote, that's a console app. I upload it to um, Azure. And if you look here, I can do some pretty crazy stuff here. This, this particular demo, um, I am running this on, you can see here, 30 workers eight cores for each worker. 
and 50 gigs for each worker. So take 30 multiplied by 56 gigabytes of RAM. I can, in Azure, I can run, run this on a huge pile of hardware for a brief period of time. And so a complicated query like that, looking at all the data in GitHub, can run in roughly about 30 seconds. Um, and so I've got that uh, just down here. This is the run I did at build. You see it took about 32 seconds. Um, I scaled the hardware back after that. That's why the, the ones over here took more time. Um, and here was the result of that. Here's the top projects in GitHub that are C Sharp based. And it's interesting because you can see a couple of mine, Core CLR, SignalR, Roslyn, CoreFX, you would expect that. Um, but the graph's kind of interesting. If you look at the codes, this color is Sunday. And the, the, I'm colorblind, so whatever the color at the top is, that's on Saturday. And you can see the Microsoft repos nobody works on on the weekends. Um, and the open source projects are all worked on, or the, or the community projects are all worked at on the weekends, um, which is kind of what you would expect. I just don't show this to my bosses. OK. Let's get to more fun stuff. So next thing is machine learning. Uh, this is something that .NET really didn't have a, a huge hold of a year ago. A year, a year ago in May, we announced the first preview of ML.NET. Um, we have now shipped uh, v1 of ML.NET. And the whole goal here is, one, as I said before, if you're a .NET developer, you should not have to go learn Python to write uh, machine learning. Inside of Microsoft, a lot of our teams actually will start with Python and they'll then convert the Python model into C++ or C Sharp based on the type of application they, they have. But our goal here is you can create custom models using C Sharp or F Sharp without having to um, leave the .NET ecosystem. The next thing is, we did, I did a demo at Build last year, and my, my, I asked my team, how did you choose the algorithm for this application? And they said, uh, uh, we just guessed one and it just worked. Like, well, that didn't seem very like you're very sure of this. So uh, we have a tool called Model Builder, um, and I'll do a demo of this in a second, and it will help you actually figure out the right algorithm for the uh, ML, ML workload that you have. And then finally, uh, we want to make sure that our tech can work with all the op other open source projects like TensorFlow, Onyx, uh, and, and so on. So you don't have to, you know, you can do Tensor, and I'll show a demo of that too as well. And this tech, is the same tech that's been running in actually Windows and Office for years. If you've ever seen Windows Hello, that's where it actually recognizes your face and logs you in. That's ML.NET. If you've been in PowerPoint and it actually recommends a template for you, that's ML.NET. Um, so it's actually running in, in tons of Microsoft projects and has for years and years. Um, next thing on ML is, you know, I, I ask a bunch of developers, who wants to use machine learning? And all the hands go up. And then I go and talk to somebody and say, what would you do with it? And all the hands go down. Because um, it's like, yeah, it's cool tech, but what the heck can I do with it? So we're trying to help there. So this is my uh, page on my website, .NET slash ML, and we've taken a bunch of common scenarios that you might want to use machine learning for, um, and we have both some docs and samples for each of these, for like sentiment analysis, uh, is somebody happy or sad, product recommendations, you've been on, a, on an e-commerce e shopping site that recommends other products for you, uh, price prediction, um, GitHub Labeler was the demo we did last year at Build, um, where basically we took all the data from GitHub, and you know, an engineer at Microsoft takes, takes each of the, the issues that are filed and makes sure it's filed under the right place. Well, our GitHub Labeler is a bot that we now run that automates that, so as people file issues on .NET, they automatically get moved to the right place without even us touching them. Um, so these are all there and, and good to go. Um, and then we announced this as well. Uh, this is a plugin that works today in Visual Studio. It can also be done with command line uh, to work with Visual Studio for Mac or Visual Studio Code. And this is a tool that helps build models for you in .NET. And it's just best if I just do a demo of this. So what I'm going to do is I've got a Blazor app here. And I'm going to run it real quick. It doesn't do a whole bunch. Uh, but the idea here is I've got a website, and on my website, people can give, give me feedback, or they can, they can write a review of a product, and I might want to know, was it a good review or a bad review? If it's a bad review, I might want to reach out to that customer and ask, why are you unhappy? And so the idea is I can type stuff here, 
and press submit, and uh, this meter would actually change in real time and show me uh, the status of this. So how would I do that? So what I would do today is I can take this exact project here, <clears throat> and I'm going to cheat a little bit here and copy some code. So I'm already ready. So what I, what I can do here is I can take this project, and I'm going to right-click on it. <clears throat> and because I have Model Builder installed, um, machine learning now shows up as an option. I'll click that. And what's going to happen next is a bunch of those same scenarios you saw on my slide now show up inside of the tool. And in my case, I want to do sentiment analysis. And so the, the real trick on machine learning is you have to have some data that's been trained. By training, what I mean is I need to have a bunch of reviews. Somebody's already said that's a good review or a bad review. And with that data, I can train a model uh, that can pr predict that in the future. So um, we actually stole some data, not stole, um, it's available. Amazon has a bunch of their review data available publicly that's actually been scored. And so what I've got on my desktop is I notice I can do a, a file or a SQL. Um, I'm going to select the file. And here's some reviews. And what the tool is going to do is it's going to show me um, the columns in that file, the CSV file. And it's showing me here's the, the text somebody wrote. And one is good, and zero is bad. Um, so somebody wrote a bunch of these. This is a small file. Um, just for demo purposes. Um, now what I can do is say, yeah, it looks good. I want to predict this in the future. I want to be able to give it some text and predict that sentiment on the left side. So I select sentiment. And then what we can do is scroll down next and say train. And I'll put 20 seconds in here. And I'll say start training. And you're going to see it start going through and trying all the different algorithms that are supported in ML.net. Uh, and trying to see which one of these is the best based on that pre-trained data. Um, and it'll take about 20 seconds. In, in, the, in real world, you actually would want to run this for actually more like a couple of days. We actually ran the, the full file for many days um, to get an awesome model. So it's finalizing the model. There we go. I can now click to evaluate. It's going to show me which of those got the best score, but even better, I go to the next step, which is code. And I can say Add Projects. And so what it, what it just did is it went and added over here uh, a console app that I can try it with and a model project. And it actually gave me some code. That's the code I actually just copied to my clipboard um, that I can use here to actually add this to my application. So I'll, all I should have to do is go up to my, my web app. Click on dependencies, add a reference, add that new model file, press OK. So now I've got that code in my application that, that, that's now referenced. And the next thing I need to do is I'm going to cheat a little bit, bring the juicing statements into back in, and take that code. Let's take the code I already have here. Let's comment that out and paste that code in uh, from the wizard. Now, I should be able to compile the same app. And now my app is using machine learning. So it took me two or three minutes, mainly because I was just talking to you about what I was doing to, to get this going. We can run it again. And now, if I go to Review, I am happy. Bad, bad, bad. Um, so you saw, in just a couple of clicks and pasting some code in, you can take any of your applications and add machine learning. Is that cool or what? OK. So we'll talk about Xamarin real quick and do a small Xamarin demo. Uh, Xamarin is a company we acquired about two years ago. Uh, they, you know, they obviously support building mobile apps on .NET. And the way we think of Xamarin is you know, it's an open, open, open source platform for basically letting you build on any of the devices. Uh, you know, iOS could be an iPad, a, a phone, a watch, Android, Android TV, uh, iOS TV, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
And the idea here is, is really basically build the same business logic one time and share it across those apps. So like UPS, they wrote their, all their tracking stuff is written in C-sharp, and they share that same C-sharp logic across both the Android and the iOS uh, version of that. Um, and so that's kind of the, the premise here. We, uh, after we acquired Xamarin, we have dramatically improved the tools. So uh, I used to hate installing the mobile tools for, if you look over here, 23 gigs in VS 2017, down to 7 gigs in 2019. Um, so we've made that a ton, a ton better. Um, and it, we're still doing work here. Here is VS 2017 uh, creating and building a project. You'll see it'll take about a minute, while 2019 does it in 30 seconds. So we're, we're continuing to make that a better experience. Um, I'm going to just do a very quick demo here. Um, and the point is I want to show the whole idea of .NET is you know, I can share this code across many types of applications. And so here is that same app I just showed as a Blazor app in ASP.NET. Here it is instead um, in Android and iOS. And so if I look at my Android app under my references here, if I look around here, I'm going to find TensorFlow. That's the way to get hardware-accelerated AI uh, on top of uh, an Android device. Um, and if I want to look here, this is a, I've got one of the uh, sentiment files from the iOS app, and it's using Core ML. That's the library that uh, is hardware-accelerated for iOS. And, um, but if I, if I minimize all these, you're going to see, just like for that other C-sharp project, I've got a simple, here it is. Here is my app model share. Um, and I've got my model.zip. So I'm sharing a model across all those projects. And this should just do exactly what you would expect. Um, it's going to actually launch the Android emulator, running a similar app that you just saw. And I can type the same kinds of things. I'll get the same types of results. And I've got one more crazy version of this app we'll show um, at the very end today, where I take all the new features of ASP.NET, like gRPC and uh, worker services, and apply them all together uh, to make a crazy um, application. So it says the app is running. Here we go. Same thing. Let's see what it does. It goes black. The Android emulator has died. Try and start it one more time. If it doesn't start, the only way to fix it is to actually restart the emulator, which I'm not going to do with the amount of time that we have here. This is a software emulator, um, but my machine, because I'm actually running Docker containers as well, I have Hyper-V installed, so I have all the crazy things installed at the same time, which causes the emulator to be a little not stable. Um, there's a version of, of the emulator coming out later this year that will actually fix this. It's actually a Windows problem. <laughs> but it seems like the uh, emulator has left the world. The only solution to that when that happens is basically to load the, uh, I'll do it for fun just to start it up. I'll, I'll continue, but I'll come back to it. So what I can do here is go on the, on the uh, emulator here to a factory reset. That'll put it back into a good state. I can relaunch it. And while that's going on, let's go back to the slides and I'll come back to that. But basically, I was going to show the same app <coughs> running on a device. Um, now let's talk about .NET Core 3. Um, we're actually at Preview 6 today. Um, it shipped about a week ago. I'm on Preview 5, so I left the slide at Preview 5 um, because I don't want to try to update my entire machine to Preview 6. But our goal with .NET Core 3 um, is to basically bring um, the remainder of, like, kind of the, the desktop workloads to .NET Core. So first thing, we have WPF and WinForms come to .NET Core. Uh, NDD Framework 6 comes as, as well. We open sourced uh, both the desktop stacks. They are Windows only because they're Windows tech. Um, something new that's in .NET Core 3 is we've always had the ability to have side-by-side -side in .NET Core, but now we have the ability to do self-contained exes, which I'll do a demo of. 
Um, we have Blazor, which I know there was a talk here this week on, or there's a talk later today, um, and that's building full stack web development with C Sharp, and we'll do some demos there. Um, significant performance improvements. Basically, .NET Core 3 in web, web performances is half the memory that .NET Core 2.2 uses, and the perf uh, is about 30% faster, so huge improvements. C Sharp 8 is part of .NET Core 3 as well. It brings a bunch of new stuff as well. So um, this is kind of just interesting. We open sourced WinForms and WPF in December of last year, and this graph is basically showing you kind of the, the number of uh, community issues and PRs we took on CoreFX. You know, that's .NET Core when it first shipped. And it's showing you that WinForms and WPF actually are tracking very similar. You know, you, you, a lot of folks are like, does anybody build WinForms apps or WPF apps? Well, two and a half million people a month do. Um, but we've taken, uh, as you can see, hundreds of PRs uh, from the community since we open sourced it. So we're very happy to see that the, uh, the community is embracing it. Um, these are the big .NET Core 3 themes. Desktop, full stack web, AI, big data. We've already done the two on the right. Um, desktop, as I said, we have two and a half million people doing this a month. Um, and so we brought WinForms, WPF. Uh, UWP will come later this year. Um, and you get access to all the Win10 APIs as part of building a .NET Core 3 app. Um, the big reason why you would want to do this is deployment flexibility. Even for a web app or a desktop app, the biggest challenge with .NET Framework was, you know, if Windows Update ran, your app might not run again. Or if you put a new version of .NET, .NET Framework on the machine, maybe it breaks the apps on the machine because there can only be one .NET Framework on the machine. With .NET Core, you can have as many .NET Cores on the machine as you want. You can actually copy it into the same folder of the app. You can make the app into a single exe. Um, we also have massive uh, API improvements that we've done in .NET Core. For backwards compatibility, we can't even fix perf in some of .NET Framework because .NET Core is side by side. I can change those APIs. Uh, and because of that, you're going to see, in some cases, if you're doing networking, you're doing file I.O., you're doing JSON parsing, parsing you're going to see three times uh, perf improvements. So this is a demo I did uh, a couple years ago, actually, at Build. And I have redone it to work on the latest versions of .NET Core. And it's kind of cool. So let me. What I did is I took a simple WinForm app. And what it does is it goes and looks at my, my, my machine. Uh, you give it a folder, and it enumerates all the files and makes a pie chart. And the, the, the big thing this app shows is it shows the perf deltas uh, between .NET Framework and .NET Core. And for compatibility reasons, I just want to show that I can use a Telerik DLL that was not ever compiled for Core. Um, because .NET Core 3 has all the APIs that the Telerik DLL requires, it just works without any recompilation. Um, let's run this app. This is the .NET Framework version of the app. I'm going to give it my source folder, which has a lot of, a lot of stuff in it. And I'll click Run. So it's going to go and parse all my, all my files in source. And it's going to give me a result. And just to make it not fake, I'm going to run it one more time so everything is, is spun up and, and going fast. So 18, 25 milliseconds. So let's go run the same app. And this time, let's run it on core. Give it the same folder. Ah. And what you should see here is .NET Framework, .NET Core. And that's because the file APIs in .NET Core are just faster than the file APIs were in .NET Framework. So your same app uh, can, can just go and be a lot faster. Let me do one more desktop app real quick. Um, <clears throat> the only highlight of this, this application is uh, the tooling, even in, in uh, the, the preview 6, uh, won't be probably till preview 7, we have a checkbox for this. Um, and this is not just for desktop apps. This is an app, uh, a feature you'll be able to use on web apps as well. Um, what I've got here is just a basic WinForm app. 
not super exciting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the folder it's in, and I'm going to just kill everything in the bin folder. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the CS Proj for this app. And I've got something commented out here. These are new things that, as I said, the tools don't, don't support it yet. But I just copied in something and said, I want to publish this to a single file. Um, and because I want to make a single file, you have to tell it what architecture that has to be. You can't make a single file that runs on you know, various platforms. So I give it those two options. Just make sure everything is good here. And then I should be able to come over here and do a publish. And say that. And then the result that I'm going to get is I'm going to get a huge friggin' file. So um, 128 megabytes. Um, <clears throat> but it is a single file WinForm application. And you might go, Scott, is all my .NET apps going to be 128 megs? No. Um, what I'm not showing is we also, in .NET Core 3.0, are adding a linker. And what the linker will do is the linker will remove all of the .NET files from this application that are not necessary. Uh, so for example, if you're not using localization, then it'll just take it out. Um, I'm not running the linker yet, because it didn't work in the preview bit, bits that I have, preview 5. But the linker is enabled in preview 6. Um, and with that, the app size will cut below half. And then I'm going to show some technology a little later in the presentation where we'll get that down even smaller, and I'll explain that. That'll come in the next wave of .NET. So um, we have both of these things that are, that are kind of cool here. Next thing is C Sharp. Uh, first off, this, this slide is almost unreadable. Um, I asked Mads Torgerson, who I hope will come here and speak here next year, um, to build me a slide that showed every C Sharp 8 feature in one slide. Um, and so it's, it's, it's kind of unreadable. This is a feature called range, ranges, where when you pass an array, you don't have to pass the entire array. Now you can see I'm passing everything from two on to the end. Um, that's ranges, and I'll, sh I'll show this in more detail. Nullable reference types, this is my favorite feature. Um, we have telemetry in .NET that shows that null reference exceptions are the most, pop most popular, most common uh, exceptions that customers see. We see null exceptions in .NET all the time. And this is a feature where we force you to actually put a check before you actually reference a null, a null reference kind of thing. Um, and I'll do a demo of that in a second. Um, and notice here before, because he's got a name, he's got a check here to make sure it's not null. If it took the check out, it would complain on that right line. Async streams. We added async await years ago, uh, but it never worked for I enumerable. Now in .NET Core 3, with C Sharp 8, it works with iEnumerable. So in this case, I can call an iEnumerable and await it. Um, this is great for web workloads, for things like uploads. Um, um, and then there are switch expressions. This syntax is so complicated, I, I can't even talk about it, so we'll just skip. Um, recursive patterns, default implementations, and more. So let's, let's jump to this code real quick and go to C Sharp 8. And I'll highlight a couple of these things. So ranges, um, one of the things we're doing in 3.0, we won't have it in, in all of it, but we're trying to go, go in and make sure that all of the um, APIs that you call uh, can support ranges. Um, in this particular case, when I first start the application, I say args, and I would normally just pass the whole array. Um, but in this case, I can say I want just the first two. And so if I look at the app, and when I run it, you can notice that I passed in one, two, three, four, five. Um, so when this runs, it should only display one and two on the screen because I only asked for the first two. That's ranges. Um, nullable exception, nullable reference exceptions, which is my favorite, is imagine I did something something like this. Common C-sharp. And then um, 
Somewhere in my app, I say something like this. So that's obviously an error because I, I assign string to null and then I tried to reference the, the first element of, of it. But if you notice here, VS is complaining already. It's going, hmm, non-nullable type. So it's actually saying, I should do something here. Let's say declare it as nullable. So it's basically saying, because string is a reference type, uh, it can be null. And so it should have the question mark saying, it could be null or not null. Then, because, look at this. Dereference of possibly null references. So the compiler now knows that I could blow my foot off here. And so it's asking me to write this code. Now all the squiggles go away. Now I will warn you, turning this on in your code, I, I challenge anybody in the room, after the session, go find some .NET Core code you have and turn this feature on um, and watch what happens. You're going to get errors all over the place. We have spent, uh, Emo Landworth on my team was telling me that uh, they can go through 1,000 APIs an hour as they go through the BCL, making sure the BCL doesn't have any of these problems. Um, and we've been shipping that thing for 18 years. Um, so finally, I'll just, I'll just show that crazy uh, switch statement again. Here's the types that I have. I've got this uh, customer type down here with a first, a last. Um, and you can see I made a few of these. I made a, a Scott Hanselman, a Scott Hunter, a Null Smith, a Null Jones. Um, and this switch statement lets me actually look at that customer and say if it's null, if the whole customer is null, return a null. If it's got a null first name, but it has a last name, add Mr. 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 in front of it. If it's got both names, return both names. So you can do really complex switch statements now that cross multiple fields inside of a, a type. Um, but I, I find it hard. Mads will hear me say this and be mad at me, so sorry, Mads. Designer, language designer at Microsoft. Um, next, let's talk about ASP.NET Core 3. Um, .NET Core 3 is not just about desktop. There's a ton of awesome web tech. Um, we have gRPC. Um, this is kind of like, people ask Scott, where is, when's WCF coming to .NET Core? And the answer is, it's not going to come to .NET Core um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it was going to take three years to port. Um, and then number two, if you're building a brand new application, is that the tech you want to use? We think gRPC is the tech you'd want to use because gRPC, um, it's an open source project. And the cool thing about it is there's clients for gRPC in all the languages. So you can write a C-sharp gRPC server and call it from JavaScript. You can write a C-sharp gRPC server, gRPC server and call it from Java. You can actually take a, your .NET app and it can call a Java gRPC server. So, gRPC server. so the tech is fully um, cross-platform. And so we think if you're building modern services, you want to use something like this. There's some rough benchmarks that have been done showing it's about 30% faster than WCF and it uses half the memory of WCF. Uh, worker service. Um, this is a, a really cool feature. See how much time I have if I can show it. Um, for a long time, if you're trying to build a microservice, we don't really help you inside of .NET um, because our default projects always have UI. Um, and so worker service is, the, is the, the start of actually letting you build or giving you a template to build microservices. In this case, it's a long-running process. You're building a microservice that's going to read from a queue and take an action and do something. Um, <clears throat> but you get to keep all of your ASP.NET cool features. We give you logging. We give you configuration. We give you DI. So you get all the same things you would get in a full web ASP.NET application, but you get them in a simple worker service. APIs and identity. Um, if people in the room have built a spy app using Angular or React, uh, or they've just built a um, a regular app, uh, MVC application, how do you add identity, identity to that? How do you actually protect the APIs in your application? Historically, we just said, good luck. Um, and what we're doing now is we're actually embracing an open source project called Identity Server. Um, and so what we do is we have uh, a simple NuGet package that you can actually add to your application. 
and it will bridge identity server with ASP.NET, and you just add authorized elements to your uh, APIs, and they'll flow all the way even into an Angular app. Um, and I might just show that because it's it is kind of cool. So let's go up here. So this is just a regular Angular JS uh, application uh, with a .NET Core backend. And what I want to do is I want to say that when you call uh, one of my APIs, I want you to actually have validation to see that that thing is, you're allowed to call it. So here's my Angular app. And uh, I've opened up one file, uh, the app modules file. And you can see I, we've added this API authorization model. And then what I can do is I can, I can basically say, for this URL, fetch data, I'm going to say that requires an authorized guard. Um, and that will basically prevent anybody calling that without being signed into the application. So as I said, this is just an Angular JS app. And you're probably handwriting this stuff today using whatever technology, I don't know. Um, Come on, Angular. Are you going to start for me or not? Let's go on and close a few things out here. There it goes. So, you know, this is an Angular app. I click around. It's a spa. Things just work. Make sure I'm not logged in. That would be bad. Um, I can click around the app just fine. But if I click Fetch Data, what's going to happen is all those rules are going to kick into effect, and it's going to say you have to log in. So making it very easy to take a, uh, any of your, your web applications. Um, and add auth to them. We've always had great auth, but never great auth for APIs. OK. Password manager is like, I want to save your password. OK. <clears throat> so that runs. I need 30 more minutes. Um, <clears throat> next thing to talk about is, is um, I'm, I'm going to sk skip that demo for now, uh, Blazor. So um, Blazor was something that we did as a demo a couple of years ago, and it became much bigger than I ever expected. Um, and the idea behind Blazor is, can you build a spa application staying in C-sharp all the time? I don't want to use Angular, React, or Vue. Um, I just want to use C-sharp both on the client and the server. Um, and so we have this. It'll ship as part of 3.0. Um, it runs in all browsers. Um, and the benefit here is you can actually have strongly typed objects on the server and the client. So you can have a C-sharp app type on both the client and the server, and it just moves back and forth. Um, you build a, a Blazor app using our template, you get a spa out of the box. You, nothing you have to do. You just write a regular um, Razor-style application, and it's just a spa. Um, we have this really cool feature where uh, an optional thing called WebAssembly. Um, and with WebAssembly, we actually compile the C-sharp code directly into an IL that can be run by the browser, and you get native performance. You don't get native performance in my preview, so I, 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 want to, I just want to warn that it will not be until later this year you, you'll get that, that performance. And so what will happen is when you run the application, um, you'll actually see .NET come down to the browser. Not the whole .NET, just the small part you need, probably two or three megs. Um, and then your app runs completely standalone. You can write an offline application that runs with no internet. Um, and so you can run native C Sharp in the browser. I'm going to skip this demo real quick because I want to show a few more slides. And we'll come back and I'll show the mega demo that shows all this stuff. Um, so. The real question next is, <clears throat> after .NET Core 3 ships and, and uh, later this year, what's next? What's the next big thing for .NET? Um, and so we think of it this way. In 2014, this is about the time we acquired Xamarin. Um, <clears throat> this was the world we lived in. There was a .NET framework. It's been here forever. 
Um, I, had, I, had, I had worked on building a .NET Core because I know we needed to have an open source cross-platform .NET, and so we built .NET Core. We couldn't really turn .NET Framework into that because it was already shipped and it was what it was. Um, and then, of course, we had Xamarin uh, for building iOS and Android apps. Um, and so I had three .NETs. Like, this is not good, Scott. Um, so what can we do? So in 2016, um, we want to make it very easy to share code across all those .NETs. So we introduced .NET Standard. And what that was was a contract saying that each of these .NETs has to implement this common set of APIs. And once they do, you can write a NuGet package that runs on all three of them. Um, so that was, a, that was a step. But now we've actually had Xamarin in the, in the team for a while, and we said, what if we took it to the next step, which is this? We merge everything together into a single .NET again. Um, and this is .NET 5. And what this is is the best of .NET Core and the best of Mono all merged together into a single framework. And there's a bunch of benefits you're going to get here is uh, one base class library. So you, you'd be surprised. My team actually writes three BCLs today, um, which means there's different bugs in different ones of those. Now there's one common BCL across all your .NET apps. Um, the Mono tech had some really cool tech. It had native tech where you could actually, you know, because it has to run on iOS, um, it has the ability to build a single native exe that requires no jitting. Um, anyway, I'm calling that native. We're going to make that work on all your application types. So if you want to build an uh, ASP.NET microservice, um, you can, and it doesn't have to jitter or anything at all. It'll be a single exe, probably 15 or 20 megs. Great for microservices. Put in your container, you're good to go. Um, so what you get here is you get all the app types, desktop, mobile, web, cloud. Um, you get the best of core and mono put together. Uh, one BCL, still .NET standard compliant. One tool chain. So if you've built a, a Xamarin project um, or a WinForm WPF project, they, you know, they had different project types. Now everybody's using the exact same simple CS proj that we have in .NET Core. Um, you get both the just-in-time compiler that all the ASP.NET apps and the desktop apps use, plus the native compiler that the Xamarin tech used. Um, because it is using some of the Xamarin tech, you could actually write a .NET Core application that actually talked to Java or talked to Swift code directly. So that'll be .NET 5. <clears throat> it's also, we need to say what's not in .NET 5. .NET 5 is not going to contain web forms, WCS server, and Windows workflow. Um, these are three older stacks that are, we're going to keep on .NET Framework 4.8 only. Um, you might ask why. Well, it takes years for me to port them. And why would I want to port the older tech when it runs great on 4.8? Um, you should use Core for building new apps. Keep your old apps on .NET Framework 4.8. If you actually are moving from the old tech, Blazor is a great replacement for web forms. It's got the same programming model because it's component-based. gRPC is a great replacement for WCF or remoting. Um, and then <clears throat> one of the company's uh, UI path has actually ported Windows for Workflow to Core. And so that's already available in GitHub today. It's a great port, um, and you can use that. Now, when we're done, we have a unified platform where all the stuff runs on .NET. Uh, but I want to be very clear. You still keep all the core benefits. We're not going to have some huge .NET again. It's not going to be 100 gigs or 3 gigs or whatever the heck it is today. Isn't, you're not going to have that. You're going to still be able to have very small apps that only use the parts of .NET Core that you want. Um, so you get the best of all the worlds. If you want to build single exes, you can do that. If you want native exes, you can do that. Um, now, the next thing is, what's our, what's our ship plan on .NET Core 3? Um, RC, technically Preview 7, it's going to launch uh, in a few weeks in July. Um, and that, that's going to be when, if you build a, uh, a, a RC-based application, it should compile just fine on the RTM bits, because we're not going to change the APIs anymore. September will be the .NET Core 3 RTM. Um, and then we'll have our long-term support version uh, in November. Now, I want to go further than that. I, I just announced kind of .NET 5. When would that ship? Uh, we want to make it very clear when .NET's going to ship in the future. And so what we're doing is we're going to actually go to a yearly cadence. Every November, there'll be a new .NET. Uh, there'll be .NET 5. Next November, there'll be an LTS build. Uh, the November after, then there'll be a .NET 7 in 2022, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see there's a every year, there'll be a new .NET Core. Every other year, there's a long-term support, which means any of the LTSs 
um, uh, you have full support on for three years. But we're trying to be very open in, with our schedule so you don't have to guess when the next core is going to come out. Um, it's going to be very, very easy to look at. Um, this is a conference we have, virtual conference in September. It'll be our launch. Um, but now, in whatever time I have left, let me show a crazy demo real quick. So I have... Let's do this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to load a crazy Blazor app called Blazing Pizza. Um, I wish I had more time. Find me, find me an hour or two after this. I'm happy to show you the code personally. Um, and this is showing a spa app running on .NET Core. Um, but it does everything imaginable. Um, this is actually using those worker services that I mentioned before. So this app is, first, it's the spa app, Blazing Pizza. But I also have a delivery worker and a pizza worker. And so what happens here is when I order a pizza, all that actually happens is I put that pizza into a queue, and then the pizza worker will actually look, at, look for that queue. And if it finds something in that queue, this is my new worker template. So once again, if I look at the program CS in my worker template, it boots up the same way as a web app does, but it's using a, a, a new create default builder, not a web builder. Um, it's got the same DI configure services that an ASP.NET app application has. Uh, but in its startup, it's got a start where you can do all your configuration. It creates the queues that they don't exist. And then it's got its execute mechanism here, which basically, if you see here, it's looking at the queue and say, is there a pizza there? And if there's a pizza, I'm going to go grab it. Once it grabs that pizza, it sends some status using gRPC back to the client, telling the client, hey, I've got your pizza. I'm working on it. Um, and then it puts, when it's done, it puts the pizza on the delivery queue. So it's cooked the pizza. It goes on the delivery queue. And then I've got another worker process called the pizza worker. And the pizza worker, what it's going to do, once again, same model you saw before. It's going to have a start async where it goes and makes sure all the queues and stuff that is required are there. And then what it's going to do, it's going to go out and start doing a loop as it goes and sends that pizza uh, out for delivery. And so let's just run this app real quick. I see VS is not happy with me. So this is a Blazor Spy app that I did not have time to demo earlier. Um, and you'll notice it's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool app. As I click through it, it's a spa. It's not redrawing the whole page. Everything is fluid. I can get a Baconator. I can click here and add some duck sausage. I can add some lobster. Um, I can click order. That's a spa app. You just see that. That's, but that's a C Sharp. There's no JavaScript libraries invoked in this thing at all. Um, that same login I showed before, I got logged into this application. Let's log in. And now because I'm logged in, I can come over here and I can order my pizza. Now when I do that, you can see this worker service started doing the work preparing the order for this particular pizza. That worker service kicked off. I've got another one. So let's go watch these workers go. So we call this drone delivery since it's not using the actual roads. <laughs> I believe this location it's bringing us to is actually the conference center. I tried to send it to the conference center. Um, but that's showing you those status messages are being fired via gRPC um, back to the app. And I didn't get a chance to show gRPC. Um, but gRPC is technically, um, if I go look at my Blazing Pizza application, um, it's going to have a prototype here. The way you write gRPC is you write something like this. Um, I want to have a service. It's going to have a send status. 
uh, that takes a status update. You write this, this, uh, this syntax. The reason the syntax is not C-sharp is because you, we then compile that and create C-sharp libraries for you on the fly. Um, and, and, uh, but I also could create Java libraries and everything else. Um, you can tell that by my CS proj. I've got the proto file, and then inside of my, my uh, file here, scroll bar, you can see that I'm basically saying, for that prototype, go make me, uh, go compile it for me into a server uh, so I can, I can actually call the server part of that. Actually, I should say, this is a server because the, the workers are calling into the server. So this generates the server side of the code. If I go to one of my workers and I open up the CS proj, um, it's going to have access to, actually, in this case, it's going to cheat. It's going to use this. This is a shared library. And you're going to notice in this particular one, Go down here. I tell it it's a client. And so in one case, it generates the server code. In one case, it generates the client code. Um, and if I actually look in the folder of this project, I should actually be able to show you that it actually, you'll see C-sharp files inside of here. And there's the, there's the gRPC C-sharp file. So by putting those in your, in your definitions, uh, you put the definition of that thing in. We generate the C-sharp. It just works. It's like WCF. Um, I know I'm over time, so I will just jump back to my conference here. Um, this will be virtual community, half Microsoft, half community uh, for, for two days. This will be around the launch of, of .NET Core 3. Um, <clears throat> And then takeaways I'd want to have people to say is, you know, we continue to add more workloads. ML.NET is brand new. It's an RTM. We just added big data with, with Apache Spark. Uh, .NET Core 3 is the future of .NET. Um, we'd recommend all customers, if you're building a brand new application in .NET, it should be built on core. Your old apps should stay exactly where they were, are on full framework. Um, and you can see we're on, I don't know why it says preview 3, but because uh, we're on preview 6. <clears throat> And that's what I had today. Um, I wish I had more time, because I have 10 more demos. Um, so find me afterwards, or find me around the conference in the next hour or two, and I'm happy to show you uh, gRPC or worker services. Um, actually, let me, let, me, let me launch one more, just for fun. I'll throw me off the stage. This is a, uh, another thing that uh, microservices is a, is a big thing you hear about today. And this is the final version of that first app that we added AI to. Uh, but in this particular case, I added a .NET Core 3 microservice to it. And so today, if you want to build a, an ASP.NET application that has a web API, you have to implement a lot of stuff. You have, you know, you're going to have a controller folder, a view folder. This app's kind of cool. It's that same ML app. But what I did is notice I have in, in my uh, heat, ma heat map app here, I've got a single program CS. This is a ASP.NET web API all in one file. There's no controllers folder. There's no views folder. Um, and if I look at my program CS, at the bottom, I boot up my web app like I always would. Uh, but in this case, I'm building a microservice. And so instead of actually having a controller folder, I just came and used a feature called endpoints and say, if the URL matches this URL, run this C-sharp. If you're building a microservice, that's all you might need. You don't need all the other ceremony that we have in .NET. So let's run this app. Um, what I've done is I've taken that same Blazor app, and now when I click Submit, what actually happens is it sends that request to my service, and my service kind of tracks that. Um, so I've got the, the front end app running. Let's go to the back end app. Let's put a breakpoint on here to prove that these APIs are being called. And I'll say start debugging. Give it a chance to boot up. And so what's going to happen here is 
Um, it's going to show a map. And even though I'm an American, I actually do know geography. I know where Germany is in the world. Just saying. Wow, there's Germany. And I did not look this up overnight. Um, but I go to the same app, and now I can say, awesome. When I press submit, it actually fires into that breakpoint at the end, and that breakpoint basically runs some code to save that location uh, into that web app using Signal R. Dink. And so there I showed up using Edgium and I, a happy face. Um, and that's showing how you can build APIs in .NET Core 3.0, very simple microservices. Um, and with that, I'll stop because I've gone way over anyway. So, um, so much cool stuff in .NET Core 3.0. I, I, I don't know where to stop. So thank you very much. <laughs>